So in this final video on animal behavior, we're going to be looking at the evolutionary history of animal behavior and also the idea of altruism and how it relates to animal behavior. So we'll entitle this final flowchart evolutionary history just to see how animal behavior relates back to the most important concept of biology thus far, the idea of evolution. We understand through many different studies, through many different experiments on animal behavior, that animal behavior is and must be, because it's a result of evolution, uh, based on genetics. It has a clear genetic basis. Genetics is going to create certain phenotypes, and those phenotypes will be acted upon by natural selection. Phenotypes, like we said in our very first video, can be behaviors that are adaptive. Take, for example, something as simple as a fruit fly. We understand that genetics, fruit flies, give us great amounts of details in terms of genetics. And fruit flies show us clearly that behavior must be linked to genetics because we have, in fruit flies, a gene called the fru gene, F-R-U gene. And this gene is very, very specific to a very, very important behavior. It is one single gene. So it's a single gene that controls a very important behavior that is courtship. Single gene for courtship behavior. And as I told you before, fruit fly courtship in a previous video we know involves many different behaviors, many different actions like tactile feedback. It involves um, singing of sorts. It also involves the idea of seeing a different uh, a member of the opposite sex. All of these are courtship behaviors all related to one single gene. How do we know this? How do we know that this one gene controls courtship altogether? Well, simply because if we induce a mutation on this gene that we have located in the fruit fly genome, if it is mutated, we see a lack of courtship behavior. Specifically, the courtship behavior gets modified so much so that it's completely wrong. It's a completely wrong courtship behavior upon mutation, and thus it is incorrect. Clearly, behavior is directly related to genetics all the way up to maybe even the single gene level. A single gene can code for a single behavior that can be acted upon by natural selection and evolution and thus mutations as well. So clearly there's an evolutionary link to behavior that is worth understanding. Finally, in terms of evolutionary history, a very important idea to understand about behavior is the idea of altruism. And when we think of altruism, we think of this idea of being nice, altruistic people are nice, they always think about others, and the same idea is involved in animal behavior. Altruism in animal behavior can be defined as the following. This is when we have a behavior, and it's very, very counterintuitive initially when you think about it. It's a behavior that literally, clearly reduces it very clearly reduces animal's individual fitness. The one who is completing the altruistic behavior, that animal's individual fitness is being highly reduced. And everything Darwin has said, everything we've learned about genetics to this point, has said that anybody who reduces or has a low amount of an individual fitness will not be selected for. But in terms of altruism, there's something that's very unique to this behavior. The key idea here is that, but even though this behavior seems counterintuitive, why is it still there? Why does evolution still act and say altruism is good? This is because this individual fitness, though it decreases in the behavior, it decreases in the individual, the, it actually increases fitness. So behavior that reduces animals' individual fitness, but increases fitness, not in the individual, but remember this is altruistic behavior. This increases fitness in other population members. Other population members. So members of the same species, but just other members within that population. Again, evolution acts on the population, same ideas acting right over here. So some people don't understand what is an example of an altruistic behavior. Simple altruistic behavior that many people are aware of are alarm calls. Alarm calls seem as if they're 
not individually uh, good for fitness, and they aren't because one animal is going to make a call to the entire population, and that one animal is putting itself at a huge predation risk when it's yelling and screaming, saying that there's a predator somewhere. An alarm call is simply something that warns everyone. It's there to warn everyone of potential, of potential danger. And so that means that though everyone will be warned of this potential danger, one person, one individual will have a really reduced amount of fitness because they're really putting themselves in harm's way by creating this alarm call. So then we establish with this idea that I just gave you a very big controversy. How can evolution possibly say yes to altruism if it's clearly reducing the individual's fitness? fitness. We can say that the controversy is simple. This reduces, and we've established this, it reduces animals, um, animals, individual, I-N-D for individual fitness. We know this. This is a fact because if you are yelling, you're putting yourself at a very clear predation risk. Um, why do we still see it? That's our controversy. Why do we still see this? So why do we see it. How does evolution still let something like altruistic behavior happen? Well, we have uh, Mr. William Hamilton to thank for the answer to this question. William Hamilton, an evolutionary biologist, was able to tell us this answer in about 1964. This is quite recent work done by Hamilton himself. He stated the following. He said that evolution because it acts on the population, that's the key here, evolution doesn't distinguish, doesn't distinguish between genes, so remember, genetic basis to behavior, there's a genes right here, this is the behavior that is a result of a genetic, uh, let's say, uh, genetically uh, put in idea, genetically ingrained, let's say, Action. Evolution doesn't distinguish between genes transmitted directly, so this is key here, transmitted directly, transmitted directly from parent to offspring, parent to offspring, versus, so that's the first situation. Evolution doesn't care if the genes are transmitted directly from parent to offspring or whether or not they're transmitted um, from close relatives the, versus those transmitted those transmitted by close relatives. So what does that mean? Well, a good way to understand William Hamilton's work is to simply look at an idea called inclusive fitness. Inclusive fitness allows us to see two variations of things that we are very commonly looked at, that we very commonly see in nature. Inclusive fitness includes two direct pieces of fitness. The idea of direct fitness, which is seen in populations, which is seen in specifically at the individual level. Direct fitness is simply your own fitness. And William Hamilton said it's not just about your own fitness. You have to include, that's why he calls this inclusive fitness, the indirect fitness present in a population as well because there is indirect fitness. Evolution doesn't care about the fitness that's specifically parent to offspring. It also cares about close relative fitness because those are also very, very genetically similar in terms of their fitness capabilities. Indirect fitness is simply the idea of offspring, not yourself this time, but the offspring of kin. Kin meaning relatives. The offspring of relatives also has fitness that evolution acts on. Evolution doesn't care if it's direct fitness or indirect fitness. It utilizes both in terms of its actions, in terms of what natural selection literally will select. Thus, he says that fitness is not just about yourself. It's also possibly about those who are closely related to you. So much so, Hamilton developed something called the coefficient of relatedness. He said that evolution specifically will act upon this coefficient of relatedness. And he was able to figure out that when you look at two individuals, you can clearly determine 
the probability of the following. You can determine the probability of two individuals passing down, and whenever we say passing down, we always think descent, right? Descent with modification, alleles from same common ancestor. Simply speaking, if you think of this coefficient, coefficient meaning there's actually going to be a number related to relatedness, uh, no pun intended. Over here we have, let's say in an imaginary scenario, we have two unrelated individuals. Their coefficient of relatedness, Hamilton would say, is equal to zero. If we have, let's say, a parent and an offspring, so we have parent plus offspring, their coefficient of relatedness, they're related to each other by 0.5. Five. They are half of each other's genes, and it makes a lot of sense. We don't need to get into the reasoning for these numbers, but this is just something he came up with to really show us that fitness is not simply about yourself, it's also about others. Not only are parent and offspring equal to 0 0.5, but any siblings that an individual has, they will be related to those siblings by also the coefficient of 0 0.5. And finally, the last one that was of importance to us are cousins. Cousins are quite closely related, but not as much as siblings. Their relationship to individuals, an individual will be 0 0.125. So we have cousins, siblings, parent and offspring. All of these things are going to play a role in inclusive fitness. You have to include whether or not siblings are involved in the alarm call. Are cousins involved in the alarm call? How many of them? How many siblings? How many cousins? How many parents? How many offsprings? Then the animal will make a evolutionary good decision in terms of whether or not the alarm call should be made. And that's quite fascinating to me that this animal will make the correct decision uh, because of the evolutionary mechanisms provided by altruism. Finally, we can say in conclusion that altruism is simply clearly adaptive. It is good to be nice to those who are closely related to you, not just any old people. Altruism is all about close relatedness. If there's a close relatedness like 0 0.5, 0 0.5, even 0 0.125, maybe three or four of these cousins, then altruism is worth it. In AKA altruism is adaptive as long as what we say Indirect fitness, remember indirect fitness is not your own, it's those of, of kin, your kin, of your uh, relatives. As long as indirect fitness benefits are high. So if there are a lot of cousins, if there's maybe two siblings, if there's two parents, two offsprings, the alarm call, which seems like a bad decision on the individual level, but on the population level, which is what evolution acts on, it is an adaptive decision, and thus that's why we see something as weird as an alarm call from a behavioral perspective. And lastly, altruism, in a sense, uh, there's a good way to understand altruism. Uh, instead of just saying that it's adaptive as long as indirect fitness benefits are high, we say that altruism is based off of kin selection, meaning that it's going to be based off of indirect selection and not just direct selection. So our controversy here reduces animals' individual fitness, was only looking at individual fitness, and thus was only looking at direct fitness. You have to include, you have to be inclusive in your looking at of fitness, and also definitely include indirect fitness. And when you include that and the amount of indirect fitness giving you a coefficient, you will get adaptive altruistic behavior, and thus evolution will say altruism is indeed good, depending on the amount of indirect fitness benefits. That concludes our lecture on animal behavior. Hopefully you've gained an understanding of how expansive animal behavior is. Animal behavior is complex, but at the same time it's quite simple because we see how evolution can clearly act on it. How evolution is able to encompass good behaviors versus bad behaviors. The idea of learning, the idea of complex and simple learning, all of these things are encompassed and we see this every single day in the animals that we observe, even in ourselves. So it's a quite expansive, quite applicable lecture and I hope you have a greater appreciation for this idea of animal behavior altogether.